Good afternoon to everybody. I like to welcome all those who are online and uh, those who are here at uh, the institute to um, and uh, for this colloquium. Um, as you remember, we started the, the, um, this initiative, the Colloquium in them, uh, during, the, the, during the time of COVID. And it was just uh, an idea to get together in difficult times. And, but somehow, this uh, way of meeting at least once a year seems to have had uh, the favor of people. Also, people are interested. And after all, it is always, uh, it's always nice to have a, a possibility to share a good lecture and be together, even if we are uh, far away from each other. This afternoon, we will have a very distinguished speaker, Professor Alfio Quarteroni, um, Claudio Canuto, the president of the Scientific Council, will uh, introduce him in a moment. Uh, I just want to um, welcome everybody, and I will say a few words at the end to just to maybe to um, inform you to the last news about the Institute. I just leave the floor to Claudio, who will uh, start and introduce the, the speaker. Okay, thanks, Giorgio. Uh, well, um, presenting Alfio Quarteroni is at the same time uh, the easiest task and, and the most difficult task. The, the easiest task because uh, the, 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 the quality and the level of achievements uh, he has uh, produced uh, is, uh, is uh, uh, make easy to, to, to find uh, what to say. But at the same time, uh, the number of uh, uh, achievements, extraordinary achievements, uh, uh, make difficult to, to choose. And since uh, uh, I presume that you are here not for listening to me, but for listening to Alfio, I will try to be uh, relatively quick. Um, Alfio started his career in 1975 in Pavia, the CNR Institute of Numerical Analysis, now IMATI, uh, founded and directed by Enrico Magenes. And his uh, first uh, uh, advisor, uh, early advisor, was, uh, uh, was Franco Brezzi. Uh, he became professor in Brescia in 1986, but uh, after a few years, uh, he held uh, uh, two uh, positions, uh, double, double uh, appointment uh, he, at two prestigious universities like the Politecnico di Milano and uh, APFL in, uh, in Lausanne. Uh, the, the scientific interest range from uh, uh, numerical analysis of uh, partial differential equations uh, to uh, scientific computing from uh, mathematical uh, and numerical modeling uh, to in interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary applications of uh, uh, mathematics uh, from the production of research and teaching books uh, to dissemination of mathematics. Uh, among uh, his major contribution are uh, the analysis of uh, the finite element method and the spectral methods uh, from on the methodological side, uh, domain decomposition methods, discontinuous Galerkin methods, uh, uncertainty quantification methods in uh, scientific computing, uh, modeling, modeling, multi scale and uh, uh, multi physics modeling, particularly in uh, fluid dynamics and uh, fluid structure interactions, as well as uh, reduced, uh, reduced ordered methods. The applications are uh, striking uh, for variety, engineering, uh, geophysics, uh, medicine, and sport. Uh, I think that uh, all uh, of you uh, know, uh, remember at least uh, uh, 
the uh, victorious uh, uh, adventure of a lingi sailboat in uh, in American uh, courses, uh, in America's cup. Sorry, uh, uh, is never appears uh, as an author in uh, uh, 24 uh, books, and uh, some of them are devoted to advanced research. Some are devoted to uh, university teaching and some others to the presentation of uh, lively mathematics uh, to, to young, uh, young high school uh, students and uh, for dissemination uh, countless uh, uh, interviews uh, with newspapers, uh, radio, TV, social, festivals and, uh, and so on. Matsainet uh, uh, lists uh, uh, 356 publications with over 11,000 uh, citations, uh, Scopus uh, over 500 documents uh, with uh, uh, 13,400 uh, citations. The H index is, uh, uh, is uh, 59. Uh, Alfio uh, collected uh, a long uh, series of awards. Uh, let me just mention a few of them. The Ichiam uh, Lagrange Prize uh, this, uh, this year in Tokyo, the ECOMAS uh, Euler Medal and uh, the, the, the Sam Fellowship, and is a member of uh, several prestigious academies, including uh, Academia dei Licei and the uh, European Academy of, uh, of Sciences. I will not uh, conclude the, the portrait of Alfio uh, if I would not mention his services for the community, uh, among which uh, uh, scientific di the director of uh, CRS4 in Sardinia, uh, founder and director of uh, the MOX uh, laboratory in Milano and the Matix uh, laboratory in Lausanne, uh, creator of the MOX office uh, spin-off, uh, president uh, of the first uh, ANVUR panel uh, for the evaluation of mathematics, uh, VQR, chair of several committees uh, for ERC grants in mathematics and many other panels and uh, uh, committees around the world. Alfie has been supervisor or mentor of about 70 PhD students and 80 postdoc. This uh, amazing number reveals uh, not only his uh, scientific level, but also his uh, charismatic uh, personality. For the last 20 or more years, uh, Alfio has been engaged in a, a very ambitious uh, scientific adventure the development of a complete mathematical model of the human cardiovascular system and its use in support to uh, medical doctors. And I think that this will be somehow in this field, you will deliver your contribution. So we are uh, all uh, ready to listen to you, Alfio, please. So thank you very much uh, for the invitation and, uh, and thank you very much, Claudia, for this very nice uh, generous words. It's a pleasure, an honor to be here uh, this afternoon. Uh, as you see, the title of, uh, of the talk is uh, uh, centered on uh, uh, let's see, the high heart uh, simulator. I hope you can hear me. And. Uh, Try to move ahead here. And I go, Nascondi. You see, if we can hide this and uh, uh, try to figure it out to go on <laughs> because there was a cursor before that they cannot see now anymore. So uh, nothing happens. Uh, excuse me. But, uh, uh, cursor prima qui, che non trovo più. Quindi. Theoretically speaking, uh, this should work, but it does not work. Yes, even that. Uh, sorry, <laughs> trying to figure out how to go on here and pressing all possible uh, buttons here. Interrompe condivisione, ti condivido lo schermo. Yes, I'm sharing the screen. Grazie. Uh, Non vedo più il cursor di prima. Presentation. 
So we go for screen. Presentation. So back to the previous screen. Sorry about that. <laughs> I hope we're going to solve the problem in a little while. Oh, here it is. Maybe now. This. Okay. okay. Now it's fine. Thank you very much. <laughs> here we are. All right. So let me start with a kind of joke. Uh, this is the famous uh, Diavoletto di Laplace or Laplace Daemon, say, and uh, I will try to revisit. Uh, this is a famous sentence that was considered to be a paradox at the time. So Laplace is Pierre Simon Laplace, he's a mathematician, a physicist, astronomer, a French a scientist, and uh, uh, he uh, said, or, or wrote actually in the Essay Philosophique sur les probabilités 1814, he said that we, we can consider the present state of the universe as the effect of its past history and the cause of its future state. A mind. So I use colors to identify words that I will be explaining on later on. A mind that could know at a given time all the forces uh, that keep nature in motion and all the positions of every object that constitute nature itself, should this mind be big enough to analyze all this data, it would enclose in a single formula the movements of the biggest bodies of the universe together with the smallest atoms. Uh, to this mind, nothing could be uncertain, and the future would be apparent before its eyes as clear as the past. So it's a very long sentence, and uh, with uh, some uh, basic keywords, as you see here, and uh, trying to, um, to, 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 to interpret in a, in a kind of modern way what those uh, uh, words could mean today. So all the forces, uh, let me say, all the physical laws, and if you know all the positions of every object, uh, all the positions, let us call them initial conditions of our analysis, uh, then if we, if we know all the, all the physical laws and initial conditions, then with a single formula, a single formula is a bit too pretentious, let's say with a mathematical model, pseudo mathematical model, you should be able to uh, understand and to simulate the future of the universe. And this is simulation. So we have these four uh, basic uh, uh, keywords. And uh, uh, what is about missing here is the mind. Uh, so in, in, in Laplace's demon, uh, uh, formulation and mind uh, was uh, uh, supposedly um, a, a human being, right? But this is perhaps too 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 uh, a too ambitious goal for a single for a single man. So what is what is a mind? What can we consider to be a possible, say, actor, main actor in this uh, operation? Well, perhaps the computer. So we can think that today we can put all those things in a computer and then, of course, run the simulation on the computer and try to predict the future of the state of, uh, uh, if not the whole universe, but at least uh, the process that we are dealing with. Uh, and uh, we are tempted to say that mind is a computer because computers now, we know, they are very powerful. They are very big and, uh, and, they're, very, and, they're, very, and they're very fast. And to give you the idea of... Uh, how big is a, a, a supercomputer, or well, super is a supercomputer. Let's take the, the biggest supercomputer today on Earth. And this is Frontier. It's, uh, it's capable of uh, uh, carrying out, uh, as you see, 1.6 billion or billion of uh, flops. Flops, for those who are unaware, it's a TV computing or floating point operations, say, algebraic operations. Uh, so 1.6 billion billion, uh, it's, it's a big number, right? It's, uh, uh, 1.6 uh, to the power uh, times 10 to the power 18. And uh, just to give an idea, uh, it's like having all the people on Earth, so 8 billion people, roughly speaking, and, uh, and, and uh, having them, all of them, uh, and each of them actually capable of carrying out 100 million operations per second. So this to give you the idea of the capacity, uh, the powerful, say, the powerfulness of this supercomputer. So it seems that with such a big monster, we can do whatever you want, and you can give an answer to the, uh, say, uh, Laplace de 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 demon um, uh, paradox. Uh, uh, and, and just to give an idea of uh, how, how big is this frontier with respect to our standard PC, 
uh, if you look at the number of cores, which basically means the number of independent CPUs uh, or, or brains, say, of the supercomputer, there are more than 8 million. Our PC typically has four cores. Uh, in terms of gigaflops, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, 1.6 uh, billion of billion. This is in billion. Uh, and ours is 4.7 billion. And the memory in terms of gigabyte is uh, uh, 126 gigabyte per core, while our computer is typically 32 gigabyte per core. And uh, sorry, there is a bit of Italian here, but I think it's not disturbing. Uh, the number of variables that we can, uh, we can store, it's uh, 10 times 10 to the power 14. Uh, so say 10 to the power 15, right? Uh, number of variables mean, for instance, number of, uh, of words or number of uh, figures. We have numbers, say. Now, the number of atoms in a single human cell is 10 to the power 14. So uh, even the biggest supercomputer on Earth is capable of memorizing only or storing only the content of uh, 10 cells out of, uh, see, 100,000 uh, billion of cells. So in spite of the fact that it looks like a kind of gigantic uh, uh, gun, uh, it's uh, actually only capable of uh, storing a, a ridiculous number of, uh, of information if we compare this uh, with uh, what, uh, uh, say, a, a, a biological system that the human body would, would require. Um, so the idea is that uh, if uh, we want really to describe something meaningful, which has an impact for, for, for say, biological systems, we have to get rid of the idea of having a complete description, but rather going to, to modeling and mathematical models. Say. So try to develop mathematical models, which basically means try to oversimplify the reality. Uh, of course, so this comes with the idea of approximation. We need to approximate the real life, we need to approximate the real process. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and in spite of the fact that approximating have a kind of, may have a kind of uh, bad meaning in, in a mathematical context, uh, uh, this is not that true. This is not so true, actually. And, uh, let me quote one of the sentences of uh, a philosopher, a mathematician, a politician, uh, Bertrand Russell. Bertrand Russell said uh, that although this may seem a paradox, all these exact sciences are dominated by the idea of approximation. So let us accept the idea that uh, to describe something complex, uh, we can uh, content ourselves to approximate it and to devise a mathematical model which is uh, capable of retaining the essential feature of, uh, of uh, the problem itself. Now, uh, this is pretty much the basis of what has been done in the past century. Right? In the past century, uh, we have been developing mathematical models and solving problems thanks to three pillars, basically. One is theory. Theory means uh, uh, the basic laws of the universe or a mathematical formula, mathematical theory, something that is available, is invariant in time and space, and is available forever. Then uh, this is pretty much tied with experiments. Since Galileo and Newton, experiments was a way to validate or, uh, or to confute theory. And, and, and then since the mid of the last century with numerical simulation, thanks to the availability of computers since the time of Van Neumann, say. So theory, experiment, and simulation is really governed and driven the development of mathematical model and their approximation until, until very recently. And let me start with some examples, and I, I'm just taking them from my own experience. And just to give an idea, Claudio was mentioning before what we did in, in the context of the America's Cup, uh, the goal here was to use a more powerful mathematics to improve your performance, your design, and therefore performance. And also to assist the tactician during the competition. Now, uh, there are equations, and the equations are there because we try to model the reality uh, with mathematics. And of course, in this case, mathematics is just reflecting the, is just translating, say, in mathematical terms, the basic law of nature. In this case, we have an object that is moving in two fluids, the water and the air, say, and, uh, and we, we are approximating this reality by the uh, celebrated, say, Navier-Stokes equations for incompressible viscous flows. We have a core different type of equations in the air and in the water phase because air and water are characterized by different physical properties. Viscosity and density, say. But otherwise, the equations are, are absolutely the same. 
And at the interface between air and water, there is a free surface, which is the water surface, which is unknown. And you need equations uh, to connect the variables from above and from below. And uh, these variables express, uh, these equations express the continuity of uh, the velocity field and, uh, and the continuity of the normal stresses up to the, the surface tension, say. Uh, this is the basic mathematical frame, say. Uh, we are using PDEs because uh, partial differential equations because we are treating uh, a problem uh, whose uh, basic variable changes based in time. So it's natural to have the V2 respect to space and, and, respect to time, and with respect to time. Uh, this is not yet the end of the story because the flow is turbulent around these uh, appendages. And then you have to supplement these equations by further equations, which are there to describe the way the turbulence develops and, uh, and manifest uh, around the mode. So you need to, to use mathematical models to close the system of Navier-Stokes equations, say. And here you have a plethora of possible models. Uh, let, let, let me say that uh, turbulence is not yet completely understood today, even in spite of the fact that many flows are turbulent and then turbulence is, is pretty much governing many aspects of our own life. Uh, th then you have, uh, you have the, the sail and the boat, so you have a body, and, uh, and you need further equations to describe the motion of the body, actually. And here you have uh, typically to start from basic physics and uh, to split the forces on the xy plane and then on the xz plane, say, to split the different forces. And thanks to the splitting, you end up with further equations that you see on the right hand side here on the screen. Uh, you have equations that, uh, uh, say, uh, prescribe the, 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 the motion of uh, the sail, for instance, these stand for deformation. You have equation that depends on time and space. And these are the classical, say, equations for elastodynamics. And then you have further equations that describe the motion of, uh, of the rigid body, which is, say, the hull and the appendages of, uh, of, um, of uh, the yacht. Say. So you see, is a problem that comes from uh, sports, but uh, it has uh, a certain a physical and mathematical complexity. Um, and that thanks to that, we are able to improve the, the shape of the bulb uh, to, uh, to, to have a better dislocation of the winglets, uh, which are these tiny uh, leaflets, say, that are around the bulb, and uh, to improve, uh, say, the classical design of the spinnaker, which is the main uh, sail, uh, and, uh, and also, uh, 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 somehow surprisingly, to, um, to help the tacticians in uh, trimming the sail. And uh, here is something that, uh, see, tells us a lot. Uh, I mean, as mathematicians, uh, a lot when you're actually dealing with real problems, you see, you can, you can see the way theorems are adequate to describe a specific kind of physics, right? So uh, we are solving here, we try to solve here numerically in stokes equations. Navier-Stokes equation in 3D with big forces and big initial data. And this is one of the, you, you certainly know, Millennium Prize problem, right? Uh, uh, proving the existence and uniqueness of uh, the solution to Navier-Stokes equations in 3D with, uh, with the larger data set. Now here, we certainly are in the large data regime. So in principle, you should not expect this problem to have a unique solution, mathematically speaking. Or at least uh, there is no, guarantee that uh, this problem has a big solution. And in fact, the tacticians know how to clean the sail uh, without knowing mathematics in order to have a flow which is completely attached to the, to the sail itself. You see on the left-hand side, a flow which is completely attached to the sail and to the right-hand side, a flow that is detached in the sense that if you can imagine a particle of air which is hitting the sail from the upper part is going from say right to left and from the lower part is going to left to right. So there's complete flow separation, which is very terrible in terms of uh, reducing the performance of the sail. So tacticians do not know the, the issue of, of existence of Navier-Stokes equations, right? But yet they know how to operate in order to guarantee that the flow has a kind of regular type of behavior or unique type of behavior. Uh, and it's very nice to see that mathematically, when you deal with these type of problems, uh, you can actually see the way abstract math and the reality can match 
and you can learn a lot from reality, also in terms of uh, interpretation of mathematically complex, uh, complex uh, subjects, uh, complex fields. Uh, this was uh, one example, I'll try to go on, all right. And this is a second example. The second example with a completely different kind of flavor. What you see here is, uh, in this picture, is, uh, is an earthquake that is developing in the, Bosphorus, uh, in the Bosphorus Sea. Uh, this is the region of uh, the metropolitan area of Istanbul. Uh, and uh, here we are considering three possible scenarios of uh, a fault, which is very large. Uh, it's about 90 kilometers of, uh, of uh, uh, extension. Uh, so that's very uh, potentially uh, uh, serious in terms that uh, should an earthquake uh, um, occur in that area, it should be, it will be very likely a very severe earthquake, with very high uh, magnitude, because this depends basically on the extension of the fault. So we do not know where the earthquake will arise, but certainly we know that uh, should it arise, uh, it, it would have a very large magnitude, at least order of, uh, say, on, seven to eight on the on the Richter scale. And here are considered three different scenarios depending upon the way this fold will will break. Um, now uh, again you have equations and in this case the equations are there to, 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 to mimic or to simulate the propagation of seismic waves on the ground. You see the the uh, an earthquake uh, starts at the hypocenter uh, beneath the, the soil and then it propagate, generate waves that propagate uh, through the soil up to the hard uh, crust or surface, say, and, uh, and they're governed by an equation, which is in general a nonlinear equation, uh, because this is a kind of viscoelastic, uh, say, material, a very heterogeneous material. Of course, you may have different type of uh, constitutive equations here uh, that you have to use uh, together with a conservation momentum equation because you want to describe a different type of soil, but basically you have those type of second order partial differential equations. And, uh, and when you apply them, uh, you have to decide where to apply. Typically those waves are propagating uh, without any limit, right? Um, so we, for, for, uh, for the solution purpose, for computational purposes, you need somehow to uh, limit, to, to bound the domain where we are solving your equation. And uh, then you have to introduce some uh, artificial boundary conditions because this is not actually a boundary. I mean, the only physical boundary the, is the surface where you have normal boundary conditions, but otherwise here on this vertical side, those are not boundaries, those are artificial boundaries. So you need to put non-effective boundary conditions. You want to avoid to have spurious backward coming waves uh, due to the fact that you are posing a mathematical boundary, which is not a physical boundary. Then you have different type of waves uh, typically, uh, ge geologists or geophysicists uh, distinguish between uh, P waves and, uh, and shear waves. And you see here, depicted on this picture, uh, the way they are, uh, I mean, the propagation of, all, of, those, of those waves with respect to the, to the, to the hard surface. Uh, now, you can use them to describe scenarios uh, before an actual, uh, say, uh, earthquake arise or or to validate something that happened that is, as you see in this case is the earthquake of L'Aquila and uh, describing here together with uh, the uh, GSSI uh, the propagation of, uh, of uh, uh, seismic waves and please look at the time and you see how fast are those waves these are the seconds five, five seconds six seconds you see how fast are those waves in a very short time where they're spanning some 40 or 50 kilometers. And the color here referred to the uh, displacement of the crust, right? So the, 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 uh, the, uh, you, you, you go from, uh, you see from green to, to dark blue, uh, and this is a scale that is there to indicate the way, the amount of displacement of the crust in the, in the normal direction, say. Um, uh, this is to validate a numerical method a posteriori, but you can also, of course, uh, try to, uh, uh, well, this is still another validation because this is an, an, another uh, earthquake. Uh, this was in the region of uh, uh, the Acropolis, 
uh, in, in Athens, and the magnitude was 6.0. So here you have to represent the, the Parthenon with, uh, of course, different type of material characteristics of, uh, of its composition, say. And then you see it uh, on the Acropolis, and of course you have to use different type of grids, and, um, and you want to solve the a very high frequency uh, earthquake and see the way the, the seismic wave propagates in the region of Athens and how quick it is in, 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 in its propagation. And again, those simulations are there to uh, produce numerical data that then you compare with uh, available uh, seismographic data to validate your method, but you can also use those things to describe possible scenarios like in this case, for instance. Beijing metropolitan area in another very critical area where you have a, a very long fault uh, beneath the city, you see, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very long fault of about 100 kilometers. Uh, on the metropolitan area of Beijing, uh, uh, you have uh, uh, um, almost 22 million inhabitants. The density is very high, you see 1.3 um, thousand per, per square kilometer. Uh, we try to represent the complexity, the geological complexity of the fault. Again, here you see the computational domain. We are solving in this kind of, uh, say, hypothetical cubic or parallelepipedal domain. We have 70 by 70 kilometers uh, and 30 kilometers in the vertical side. And uh, we, we, we simulate the seismic wave propagating and, and then you go uh, to, to see the vulnerability of every single building and here are tall buildings typically skyscraper and they create a system of mathematical springs say that you put under the buildings in order to transfer the information that is coming from the seismic wave on onto the, the, the building itself and again you want to build a vulnerability map because this is uh, very important for uh, reinsurance companies I mean, companies that have to insure insurance companies for very big damages say uh, and so evaluating the risk is essentially is very important. So the third application is the one that was also mentioned by Claudio before, and uh, is uh, one that is, uh, I mean, has uh, occupied most of my time in in in, in the recent years, and uh, is the attempt to do to to describe the heart physiology in uh, uh, in mathematical terms. Uh, and here is a classical roadmap that you can you have to to to. Uh, to say to, to run in a in a in an applied math context, you start from from, from data. In this case, well, first of all, you start from motivation. You need to have motivation. So we start from clinical problem. We want to solve to help doctors to to address pathological situations. So you start from clinical problem. You have pre-processing where you start to create the data, and then you have the model, the math model. Then you need to solve the model. And uh, I will show you some examples on the way this is carried out indeed. Uh, first of all, pre-processing, you start from medical images. And once we have medical images, uh, you, you have to segment them in order to reproduce them in terms of three-dimensional objects. Like in this case, this is a ventricle. Then uh, very often these uh, images are taken different times. You want to make mathematical registration of images. And once you are on the safe ground, you start creating grids. Now, the creation of grids or mesh is pretty much at the basis of numerical methods. In the very end, we solve our equations so in an approximate way, and we'll have information on the variables only at, say, the vertices of those triangles or tetrahedra, for instance. Uh, then uh, you need to create data to recover data that are not available, and those are physical data and may not be available from clinical images, and, uh, and, and in the end, we have something that hopefully will be able to, to help doctors to solve practical problems. So data come from clinics, and here you have multiple ways to generate data, but then you need to transform them into something uh, useful from the mathematical viewpoint. You need to reconstruct shapes and, um, and boundary conditions, and maybe to identify regions of, a, of the myocardium where we have scars, uh, because perhaps you have a stroke uh, or a regions where the conducibility is uh, is, is correct. So in this ventricle, you see you have black regions where uh, you have scars, so there's no electrical conducibility any longer, red regions which are healthy, and gray areas where the, the, you have still electrical uh, conducibility, but not as it should be, because the, 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 
the myocardium is partially compromised. And from a mathematical standpoint, is a very difficult problem. Is a, a, what we call multiphysics and multiscale. What does that mean? Multiphysics because you have several kinds of physical processes. In other words, you have several kind of several type of chapters, physical chapters that uh, are, are, are are there to uh, to represent the model. Uh, multiscale because uh, we want to go from the uh, level of the cell to the level of the cardiomyocytes to the level of the organ. And uh, so we go from space, a microscopic, say, scale to the mesoscopic scale to the macroscopic scale. And those in time, because there are processes that occur at the level of the microsecond and other that occurs at the level of the second, for instance, the heartbeat. Uh, so we have different scales that you have to address. We have a complex anatomy because every, every say, heart is different than, uh, than every other heart. And the uh, arts are very complex in nature, say, and uh, and uh, we have different pieces in the art that uh, are made by different kind of material with different type of uh, uh, physical and biological behavior. So it's a it's a kind of nightmare. So we want to address this complexity, and uh, we want to have uh, uh, the aim was to, to try to 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 resume in into a single system of uh, of equations. Uh, the complete uh, heart behavior. And first of all, you need to develop, say, a conceptual model and see the different physical processes that occur here. And uh, we want to see the way they are connected one another. Uh, so this is the multiphysics aspect. Uh, and the way these different physical processes exchange information, which kind of variable do they exchange? So you need to have a kind of holistic view of the whole behavior of the heart. and. Uh, and you see, I, 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 I wrote the title, the conceptual model, going beyond medical approach, because as you know, uh, in medicine, as in any other scientific field, you try to, to be uh, more and more specialized. And when you go to a hospital, you see different floors with different uh, specialties. And even if you go to a cardiology, cardiology division, you will see that uh, you will have doctors that uh, were actually experts on different uh, aspects. For instance, you have doctors who are experts of the um, art rhythm, uh, they're called the arithmologist, uh, doctors who are, are there to cure, uh, say, uh, the perfusion uh, due to the, to the, to, to the, uh, to the um, coronaries, therefore are there to, to cure problems due to restriction of coronaries, for instance. Or we have doctors who are there to, to solve problems related to, uh, say, uh, the uh, uh, failures or, or fatigue, of uh, the leaflets of the four valves that you find in the um, in the heart. So here you want to pass the message that uh, every single process is related to every other process. And uh, you need to know what depends on what. There is a fit, complete feedback mechanism and you want to see at any, at any given time uh, which are all the processes that are taking place in the heart uh, at the spatial level, say. Uh, so it's a long derivation, but you, you, you land on a system of equations, and here I just reproduce the most important ones. Uh, they are there to, to, to reproduce the electrophysiology. The electrophysiology is the process by which at any given time, at any given second, say, uh, there is an electrical stimuli that takes place in a very specific point of our uh, right atrium, and it, it, it generates an electrical field that propagates first to the atrium and then to the ventricles, and this involves not only, say, Maxwell equations, uh, but also, uh, say, um, biochemical uh, 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 models uh, that are there to describe the way the ions in the single cells are going back and forth through the ion channel. Say. Then uh, you have the generation of a force, of an active force, at the cardiomyocyte level. Here we are still at the microscopic level. Uh, you want to see the way the transmembrane potential, electric potential, generates the uh, sliding of every single cardiomyofiber cell. Then uh, this reflects in uh, a problem of solid mechanics, uh, where you have the complete deformation of the myocardium. Uh, then you have the fluid, because in every single chamber, we have four chambers, two atria and two ventricles. And uh, we have the fluid, we have fluid dynamics. And then you have the equations for uh, uh, the leaflets, uh, the valves. Then you have the perfusion of the myocardium, thanks to the presence of the, uh, of the, of the coronaries. 
uh, you have the propagation of uh, the electrical field through the torso to generate the numerical electrocardiograms. And finally, you have the cupping with the external circulation. I mean, the heart is not in the middle of the desert. It's, uh, it's in the middle of, uh, it's at the very center of the complete circulation. So you need simplified models to describe the global circulation. So this is a closed loop system. And the principle of those equations are there to represent the, say, the real complexity of the heartbeat. So uh, at the very first step, you need to, to see the way you reproduce basic quantities. Here, for instance, we are just using part of those equations to represent the electrophysiology, the way the electrical field is generated and propagating first through the atria and then down to the ventricle, say. And, uh, this is a map, the one that you see on the left-hand side, which is known. Uh, I mean, the, the arithmologists know this map because this map is the map of the ISO lines that connect those are called the ISO cores that connect points that are reached by the electrical stimuli at the same time. Right? And uh, here you see the representation at the three-dimensional level, and also you have quantitative values. So you can see from the two pictures on the right, the actual strength of mathematical models with respect to what doctors said in their, in their heads. So we have a, a dynamic picture, we have a quantitative picture, you see here we have a scale of uh, millivolts, and uh, you also have a, a synthetic view of the way this electrical field propagates through the myocardium. So this electrophysiology, this generation of the active tension and active force at every single cardiomyocyte level. Uh, the, the scale here is in kilopascal. And you see the way the different points are uh, activated. I mean, in every single point, you have a different type of strength in the uh, activation, in the, in the tension that is uh, produced. Uh, and, and this is, uh, uh, say, the uh, consequence of the presence of uh, a transmembrane potential, electric potential. Then here you see the macroscopic uh, deformation of the heart. Uh, you see down there the ventricles. Uh, here you see the left ventricle. Here you see the right ventricle. Uh, and the, this, the big one, the big hollow tube here is the aorta, the main aorta. And the, while this one is the uh, pulmonary artery, is the one that brings uh, venous blood from the right heart to the uh, uh, lungs for uh, uh, releasing the CO2 and uh, uh, in uh, intaking the, uh, the oxygen that is then brought back through these four veins. You see two from here and the two others are on the back. Uh, these two veins, these four veins bring the oxygenated blood back to the, to the, uh, to the um, upper part of the heart, uh, to the uh, uh, left atrium, and then through a valve here, uh, this oxygenated blood will enter the ventricle, the left ventricle, and then through another valve, we'll see it in a little while, it will eject it into the vena aorta. So you have this uh, systolic, diastolic uh, motion, uh, which characterizes uh, the uh, pumping function of the heart. What you see here is uh, the fluid dynamics part. Uh, you see the valves. Uh, this is the mitral valve. Uh, let's see if you can cannot see it. Um, the one on the right is the mitral valve that connects the upper atrium, the right atrium to the left atrium. Uh, I'm sorry, to the, uh, the, sorry, the left atrium to the left ventricle. And uh, the, the other one that you see here is the, uh, uh, um, sorry, you see it hidden from there. There is a, the aortic valve, uh, which uh, connects the ventricle, the left ventricle to the main aorta while the, the bar that you see here is the pulmonary valve, the one that when it's open allow the uh, venous blood to, 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 to be sent to the, uh, uh, to the lungs. Uh, the scale here is uh, the one for the uh, intensity of the velocity field. And uh, you go, as you see, from zero to 1.4 meter per second, which is uh, order of, say, 50 kilometers per hour. So the highest velocity, that velocity in a, in a healthy heart is 50 kilometers per hour, roughly speaking. Is coherently with what uh, is, uh, is learned, is taught at the uh, say, medical school. Say. Um, uh, how, wh why are you basically developing these type of models? Well, we, for two, two purposes. One is to have a better understanding of the physiology, having uh, new atlases, which are dynamic and quantitative. 
And the second one is to help doctors to improve diagnosis, uh, to, to find the best fit when you have to use a prosthetic device, or to improve the treatment, or even optimize surgical procedures. This is the, uh, the real goal of this, of this research. And uh, 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 of course, uh, this is very expensive uh, because uh, of the complexity of the problem. And uh, to, to simulate a single heartbeat, uh, uh, which involves an uh, order of uh, uh, all in all uh, about 700 billion variables for the same space-time solution of a single second, say. Um, we use a, a supercomputer uh, with uh, more than a thousand cores. Uh, this is the supercomputer Galileo at Cineca in Italy. And this takes about four hours. It takes about four hours and also quite, uh, I mean, uh, uh, cost in terms of money and in terms of... Uh, uh, consumption of energy and also in terms of pollution. So it's quite impactful. Right? So that's why we need to strive to develop better understanding and, uh, and then more accurate methods and more efficient, more accurate mathematical models, uh, so PDEs, say, and, uh, and more efficient numerical methods. Um, now, which are the main changes? If you really want to address problems of uh, clinical relevance, uh, you, uh, we need to reduce the complexity. We need to provide solutions to doctors in a much shorter time. Uh, that's for sure. We need to address variability. Sh shapes, noisy data, very often the noisy data from, uh, from clinical images. Uh, different forcing terms and addressing population, not only single individuals. So from one side, you want to develop a piece specific models. On the other side, you want to take advantage of a population study. You have to address uncertainty on data and the model coefficient through uncertainty quantification algorithms. You want to identify parameters and developing sensitivity analysis, which are the parameters that characterize the model that are more impactful on the solution. We need to develop reduced order models and uh, to uh, hopefully to uh, have algorithms that learn the model themselves. Uh, and, uh, and in the end, uh, to be able to carry out real-time analysis. And that's why we are actually using artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence, which is, uh, say, grounded on machine learning algorithms, and which is probably big data. So this is the new pillar of, of our century, having big data, uh, together with the theory, experiments, and, uh, and simulation. And uh, uh, you see, there's been a very, very fast uh, progression and development. Uh, the first perceptron or artificial neuron, uh, mathematical neuron was, uh, uh, say, proposed uh, in, uh, in the mid-50s, and you see it on the upper part. Uh, so you see the uh, simple mathematical, simple quote, quote, of course, mathematical model that was uh, there to express the first, uh, what is what's called perception. And then you see uh, major uh, developments and the major achievements in terms of algorithms uh, that have characterized this past uh, I would say 20, 20 or so years. You have uh, the back propagation algorithms that uh, allow to compute the gradients of the, uh, 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 say, cost function. Uh, you have deep learning, uh, you have uh, comp comp convolutional neural network, uh, you have recurrent neural network, uh, you have uh, alignment, you have the transformer, which is at the very basis of the child GPT or the large language model, and uh, you have uh, the tensor flow, which uh, characterize, say, the, 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 the approaches that we have today uh, to, uh, say, device uh, artificial neural network that are very, very efficient. So if you see the, the rate of uh, achievements is quite impressive. We can say that, uh, uh, I think we can safely say that uh, the most important achievements have characterized these past 15 years. Uh, and, and, and more in particular, if you look at the evolution of ChatGPT of a large language model, from last November to today is less than one, one year. We have had immense and huge progression, say. Uh, it's a new technology that is actually transforming our life. And uh, what is, uh, however, quite uh, striking is uh, the pace of this evolution. And uh, just like a joke, let me, let me show you this other technological revolution that we had in the, in the, last, uh, in the past century, say. Uh, horses versus automobiles in Italy. Right? So if you look at uh, uh, 1910, uh, 
So we had at the peak in terms of horses, uh, 20, 27 million horses in Italy. And today, actually, uh, in, in the mid 90s, uh, uh, we, we had uh, the same number of, uh, of cars in Italy. And now we have many more cars. Right? Uh, so we have these two curves, you see, and uh, we know how cars or how engines, generally speaking, have revolutionized, revolutionized our, our life. Right? In the countryside, in the cities, in the industries, the factories, and so on and so forth, in transportation. Uh, well, you see, it took about 40 years to have uh, this uh, change of paradigm. From 1910, where we had the peak of uh, horses and basically no cars, very few cars, to the time where the two curves crossed one another. It took 40 years. And now we're talking about a few years for this revolution. So we're really experiencing a different kind of uh, uh, mathematical achievement, I would say, to say. Um, well, I think I can skip this. This is just to give you an idea of the way artificial neural networks work and, uh, and why mathematics is so important, right? because we have testing, training data, testing data, and uh, we have uh, uh, the validation of the algorithms and interpretability of the algorithms. And, uh, and all this is pretty much based on, uh, on mathematical understanding. Um, uh, we uh, have been, I've been talking about mathematical models stemming from uh, physical uh, uh, laws of nature before, and now I'm talking about, uh, I've talked about machine learning. And machine learning algorithms are driven by data, right? While mathematical models are based on, uh, on physical principles or basic laws. So there are two different kind of uh, worlds, if you wish, that can continue to be propagated in a kind of independent way, but in fact, there are many reasons to, to consider them in a, in a cooperative manner, right? to see the way the two worlds can actually interact. And there are very many interchanging, uh, uh, say, lines here, where you can say that uh, uh, you can actually use physics-based models in the context of, uh, of deep learning algorithms and, uh, and the other way around. And this is producing in these very days what people sometimes call scientific machine learning and try to bring mathematics or computational science into this business, try to have a emerging or a synthesis or a fusion from, uh, say, of uh, data science uh, and, uh, and, uh, and mathematical modeling. Say. And I think that this is really where uh, we can develop new kind of math and you can be extremely successful. Um, so that's, that's, the, uh, that's the message that we like to convey and that we, uh, I do not have time to go too much into the details, but that's the way we are actually uh, exploiting these opportunities today, uh, also for our heart simulator, and try to get, uh, uh, indeed, uh, this coexistence of uh, physics-based models and machine learning algorithms. And here are some examples, right, that have been, uh, 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 say, um, proposing uh, to, uh, to take advantage of uh, this fusion between data science and, uh, and, uh, and mathematical modeling based on uh, physical understanding. Here we are learning the dynamics of the generation of the active force at the cardiomyocyte level because we do not have any law of nature or, or, any, or any mathematical model that is uh, uh, understood in this case. So you are embedding this type of uh, learning dynamics, which is purely based on uh, uh, data-driven algorithms into our global mathematical model. That's one example. This is another example we're using multi-fidelity physics informed neural network to estimate ionic, ionic parameters. Ionic parameters are those that characterize the ionic models at the cell levels, uh, where we have to describe the dynamics of the ion species through the ion channels. And of course, this is pretty much dependent on patients, say or individuals, of course, you cannot know those type of parameters that, however, are important in the model. And we try to use multi-fidelity physics informed neural network to estimate those parameters. Um, we, we use uh, emulators that are driven by data for cardiac chambers. Uh, we are not reproducing the whole complexity of the mathematical model, but just some quantities that are of interest for doctors, like the so-called PV loop, the pressure volume loop, you see, if we take a ventricle or an atrium, we want to put here the x-axis, the volume of the ventricle during the heartbeat, the relaxation and the, 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 the contraction and the relaxation. 
and uh, on the on the y-axis the pressure that changes so uh, this is something that is very important to doctors they can perfectly understand these type of pictures and uh, and uh, and uh, of course this is just an output of the whole number of variables that characterize the model so we are training our mathematical model or our data driven model in order to produce in a very short time this type of uh, result that are of interest for doctors. Uh, we do the same for the complete electromechanic function. Before it was only the uh, fluid dynamics function, now it's the electromechanical function. So including the deformation and like relaxation of, uh, of the ventricle. Or we use uh, uh, artificial neural network based surrogate model for sensitivity analysis. If you look at these metrics, you see on, uh, on, uh, on, the, on the rows, uh, all the parameters that characterize our mathematical model, which are patient dependent, and you see on the columns all the output quantities that are relevant for doctors. And uh, of course, there is a lot of uncertainty here in the determination of this parameter. And we try to perform a sensitivity analysis to find the way uh, uh, to find which parameters are particularly important on specific output functions, say. Um, now, developing this type of sensitivity analysis with, uh, say, uh, um, hard math using uh, only PD models would be unfeasible, impossible, would take forever. This is an estimate, right, in terms of years. While here, uh, we, we, in a few days, say, we were able to carry out all the sensitivity analysis thanks to uh, the, the use of uh, reduced order models that are, that are grounded on uh, data driven algorithms. Or we use, uh, 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 for Bayesian parameter estimation, we use, again, artificial neural network-based surrogate models, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so uh, the, the message is that uh, uh, to, to make this complex mathematical model for the heart uh, workable, uh, we are really exploiting uh, very substantially the use of data-driven algorithms in combination with physics-based models. There are still many problems that are open, and they're not only concerning uh, the mathematical model for the heart. I would say that these are general problems. Uh, if we uh, are moving toward an artificial intelligence society, say, or artificial intelligence inspired or guided society, we have problems with safety. For instance, accidents involving robots. Uh, while being in, uh, in the president's room, I was just looking at my, so a few minutes ago, on my cellular phone that uh, there is a news over a bow that uh, confused a box that was supposed to pull up with uh, a worker. And uh, he smashed the worker, basically. I mean, this is, this is a very important problem. Who has the responsibility for that? Problem with security. The risk in self-driving cars. Right? Problems with privacy. The violate, violation of digital personal health data if used health data to train the algorithms. How can you make sure that then uh, you are protected against personal violation? Problems with responsibility. Uh, you have black box and in biased decisions. Uh, and there are very many examples of that. Right? Uh, uh, one, one, one is, uh, this is very silly, but uh, it's one of the examples that statisticians uh, and, uh, lo love to say, right? A few, few years ago, the municipality of Boston uh, wanted to find, say, uh, roads uh, with holes right, in an automatic way. And, uh, and, and thanks to the, uh, uh, the, the use of cellular phones, we have accelerometers in there. So if you drive the car and you get into a hole, of course, you bump, and then your cellular phone will detect it. And then, uh, surprisingly, they discovered that uh, the most uh, I mean, uh, was placed uh, uh, streets, uh, roads, were in the uh, in the residential quarters where there were rich people. So, which was a bit puzzling, right? And of course, the point was that uh, the iPhones were more sensitive to uh, the, the 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 holes, you see, than uh, other uh, cellular phones. And iPhones are more costly, and they were owned by richer people. So this is just a very simple way to see that uh, you have to be extremely careful when you use data and you have to be extremely careful in dealing with the bias of data. Right? Um, so the crucial issues, we have a lot, the lack of overall governance. Uh, you know, 
big data are basically concentrated in the hands of very few, of a handful of big companies, right? Uh, you have lack of trust. Uh, now, we need a profound mathematical understanding. Uh, we need to understand the role of parameters and diaper parameters in artificial neural network. You need to end up with constructed criteria which are validated. Uh, we know very little about the convergence behavior of uh, algorithm, minimization algorithms, in particular stochastic minimization algorithms uh, that are used for non-convex loss functions. Uh, we need to guarantee the overall success. And then you have better understand the role of training, validating, validation and testing data sets. And you need more explainability. How is a certain decision based and reached? So the crucial issue here is the lack of reliability today of artificial intelligence algorithms. We need more mathematics for that, right? Uh, and I'd like to conclude with this. I think my time is about over, right? Or perhaps it's over already, yeah. So I'd like to conclude this slide. I think there is a new role for mathematicians in this uh, very time. Uh, you might have heard about this new uh, role for engineers, uh, of new class of engineers. It's called prompt engineers. Uh, you know, the prompt is uh, uh, the, 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 the way you, the prompt is the way you terminate, for instance, ChatGPT or large language models. Right? So you know that uh, uh, the quality of the answer is pretty much depending on the quality of the question. So you need to develop an art to set questions properly in order to get meaningful answers. But this requires the knowledge of the context. And, and the right interpretation of the process and the relevant, variable, relevant variables. I'm not talking here about using a large language model for just colloquial, uh, say, entertainment, but to so, try to solve problems. Right? And I think that this is, we can call it this problem setting. Having the right problem formulation is prodromic to find the right tools for problem solution. So we're moving from problem solving to problem setting. We have been trained in. Uh, uh, say the STEM disciplines for problem, problem solving, how to solve a problem. But before solving the problem, you need to, to know how to set the problem, how to define a problem, hopefully a well-posed problem or a well-set problem, well-understood problem, right? I'm pretty convinced that artificial neural networks and machine learning algorithms will become more and more successful in solving problems and will replace uh, humans for that, right? But, but the, 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 the understanding the problem is what really counts and what is still in the hands of uh, human beings. I would say from concept to solution, human intelligence comes prior to artificial intelligence. And with a little of exaggeration, I would say math versus engineering. Uh, so mathematicians uh, uh, should have the role of understanding the problem before solving the problem, setting the problem setting the right problem, understanding the basic variables of the problem, understanding the basic, say, relations between variables, equations, if you wish, or setting the problem. And, uh, and, and this is a very important time for me in order to gain a role and uh, to, to play a role in this uh, very uh, difficult business. And with that, I'd like to conclude and uh, I would like to dedicate this lecture to, to the memory of Maurizio Falcone. Of philosophy and science. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Alfio, for the for the mem for the memory. First of all, Maurizio, we all uh, remember, and uh, for also the, the hope that you gave uh, at the very beginning that uh, mathematicians uh, still uh, will uh, have a role on. Uh, uh, on the, the future development of, uh, of uh, technology. Uh, I open to questions, and uh, I don't know if I can... Uh, I just send a mail, a message, a chat, uh, so if uh, someone wants to write uh, a question... Uh, has a question. Huh? Has a question. Yeah, we start from the present. Uh, Gabriella. <coughs> Okay, first of all, I want to thank you for this talk and also for dedicating it to Maurizio, who was really a terrible loss that we have here last, last year, no less exactly. 
Um, and also, I mean, I, I very much like the, um, how can I say, the philosophy that comes out from, from your talk. This is something which, of course, with much less knowledge than yours, I also think it's very important. I mean, this was more or less the engine that prompted the idea of starting this uh, bachelor degree on uh, mathematics for artificial intelligence here in Vienna because uh, uh, I think that uh, some basis in mathematics is very important, you know, to be key that by this algorithm or that running, running them actually and uh, using them, exploiting them in a reasonable way. I want to ask you, just since you more or less uh, are a witness of both wars, because you started computing without uh, machine learning and you're already using it, uh, what is the boost that you had, uh, if you had any boost, uh, starting to rethink your paradigm with machine learning versus the past few years? Well, I would say that at the very beginning, uh, it was just a matter of uh, speeding up the solution of the problems. Now is much more than that, uh, because really, as I've mentioned, at a certain time, it's uh, it's a way to um, have uh, uh, better tools for uh, well, again for speeding up not only the solution, solving the direct problem, but solving also the indirect problem, the inverse problem, finding parameters and understanding the sensitivity and uh, deciding which is the sensitivity of different parameters. On the output functions. Every time you do that, you have to solve your direct problem many, many times because you are going to undergoing an minimization process. And uh, if your direct problem is solved in, uh, say, four hours for a single heartbeat using big supercomputers, you know that you are stuck with that. Uh, so speeding up the solution is very important. It was a great boost. But then uh, you you really see that uh, when you lack basic understanding, physical understanding, uh, you can get, uh, you can be helped by data-driven algorithms to have an incomplete, not formal knowledge expressed in terms of formula that are there forever, but in terms of uh, capability of uh, finding input output function in, very, in a very quick way, which otherwise be unavailable. So we use that for the constitutive laws at the microscopic level, for instance, or for learning the, 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 the way you can recover pressure volume loops for doctors from basic mathematical equations. And the more you do, the more you understand that the possibility of taking a mutual advantage, say, exploiting these mutual possibilities. Um, I'm, I'm considering it today as a um, companion from one side. And on the other side, when you do not have big data, but scarcity of data, which is very often the case in, uh, in medicine, because having big data means having a large population of individuals that uh, undergo very severe analysis, very costly analysis, right? So you have scarce data. You can use mathematical models to provide training data set to the machine learning algorithms. So that's why you see them uh, can, I mean, in, in, a, in, a, in a synergistic manner, in a synergistic way. Uh, to me, it's, uh, it used to be a tool at the very beginning. Now it's more than a tool. It's a, just another arm. And the thing that is in my paradigm, see, when I saw that you have three pillars, which is theory experiments and, uh, and uh, the numerical simulation, data is one of the four pillars. And it has the same, I believe, dignity as the other four pillars. We just have to, <coughs> to be aware of that and to exploit this opportunity that uh, this new technology is offering to us. Okay. Uh, other questions? Okay, I, I, have a, I have a quick comment and, and a question. The quick comment is that uh, uh, you have to trust the data, right? Because uh, you, you, you should also have the, the guarantee, not only that the, the, the physical law and the mathematical process are correct, but the, that 
that the acquisition of data has been done with uh, scientific uh, scientific attitude. Okay, so this is this is, I think is also uh, something to, to to consider in in, in the in the in the full scenario. I think the uh, absolutely uh, well yeah, two different kind of comments. One is the bias in the data that I already mentioned before. This is this is this is a killer. Right? Um, and the other is that uh, luckily we have uh, data science, statistical data science, or, or statistical learning, let me call it this way, right? Uh, which is a science that is there to help us in addressing the quality of data. So uh, in your speech last week, you, you have been uh, recalling the uh, importance of the unity of math. And I think that this is a place where we have to take advantage of all the development that we have. So statistics is the very basis of that. And, and so machine learning is not alternative to statistical approach because it's very easy to, uh, I mean, to be in a contest where data are, uh, uh, are really uh, troubling. And let me make another, before your second question, another silly example, but it's a serious example, but it's a kind of, I mean, you can smile about that, right? Uh, when, if you have a modern car, uh, you and you to take a very long journey. You know, at a given time, you you have a copy cuff uh, that is showing up and say, "Stop because you are tired." Right? Take a cup of coffee. Okay. And uh, and the, indeed, that you can realize that at the beginning you, you you tend to smile, but then you realize that I mean, it's a good algorithm that it's really capturing your your uh, you being tired, right? Now, this album in the very beginning was failing in uh, the uh, Eastern Asia, dramatically failing. I mean, it's what all the time popping up and say, stop, because you need a coffee cup, right? Because it was trained on the Western people and the shape of eyes somehow different, right? So uh, the, the average surface of open eyes are different in Western countries, Eastern countries. So to spotting all the time eyes that were partly closed, but this is not the case. Right, so that's an example where you see that the bias in the data is extremely maybe a killer. Right? So yeah, absolutely. And the second question is more, uh, let's say, in going back to the uh, realm of uh, numerical analysis uh, we are we are concerned with. And now um, there are three types of mathematics uh, in, in this business, probably in what you are doing. Maybe there is theoretical mathematics. Okay, so the, the study of the mathematical properties of uh, uh, equations of, say, object that you use. Uh, there is uh, numerical mathematics, uh, namely the, the, the mathematics of, uh, the rigorous mathematics of numerical methods. But then there is also uh, experimental mathematics, right? And, uh, and it, I think it, one should not blame on it uh, in the sense that uh, um, the the, the, the know-how of uh, a mathematician in uh, uh, approaching something that cannot be proven rigorous because it is too complicated, but still try to follow some, uh, some rigorous path, uh, some rigorous mental path, uh, is something that distinguishes uh, uh, our community uh, from that of uh, engineers, or, let's say most, uh, most engineers. So, my question could be, um, how, what is the percentage of uh, theoretical mathematics, uh, of uh, uh, rigorous numerical mathematics, and of experimental mathematics uh, that you have in your uh, complex model? Uh, that's a very tough question. Now, let me uh, I'll start giving you two examples, and then I'll try to uh, get some kind of conclusion from these two examples. The first example is a uh, is an experience that we shared together, the two of us, long ago, and that uh, struck me a lot. Uh, the first time that we went to United States to NASA, uh, so this was 1982, maybe, right? 82, 1982. And uh, we, we flew from uh, Milano to uh, New York on a 747, which is proving that people were already using uh, aircraft, three-dimensional aircraft, right? In a kind of safe way. And people at NASA, at least the, the numerical en engineers over there, were striving to solve the uh, full potential equation, remember, 
full potential equation for a two-dimensional layer form. So this was the a full potential equation is a nonlinear Laplacian scalar equation in a two-dimensional environment, say around the section of an airfoil. So this was the level of, this is the type of understanding of math at that time. And yet we are flying safely and relaxingly on a, on a, on a 3D aircraft. Not relaxed, but uh, <laughs> some of them were relaxed, other, little <laughs> less. Say, but but the, you have to admit that the number of uh, accidents always been extremely low with respect to the number of uh, safe flights, right? Okay, this means what? This means that mathematics was really lacking behind the discovery. And, uh, and, and to me, this was a lesson. I mean, the progress of human being uh, very often is not driven by the mathematical discovery, very often. Sometimes, fortunately, yes, but very often, no. And still, this should stimulate mathematicians to put better understanding in math, right? So we should not look at kind of duality, right? You should look at the fact that you have science and you have technology and the pace of advancement of science and technology is not really synchronized. And this should not create any frustration from either side. That's my first remark. The second remark about experimental mathematics. And this is another lesson that I learned was uh, when I was uh, involved with Alinghi. Now, Alinghi, the, the first Alinghi was run, Alinghi, say, uh, sorry, America's Cup, I was involved in. Uh, this was uh, uh, 2003, from 2002 to 2003, was uh, run in uh, New Zealand. So New Zealand is at the antipode of Italy, right? So if you, if you make it through, you pass through the center of the, uh, of the, uh, of this, of the, of the earth, you go uh, end up in, uh, in Oakland, New Zealand, which means 12 hours of uh, uh, gap. And there was some time, time lag. So we were working overnight, and they were sailing over the day with two hours of lag. When we were working, they were sleeping and vice versa. So we we're carrying out simulations overnight, and we had the results of our simulation. Early in the morning, they were experiencing on, uh, on the sea before, before the competition, right? And then they had plenty of sensors and returning to us their feedback uh, by the evening. And so we had this early in the morning, and, and, and this is a kind of a continuous loop, right? And the very point is that the competition were set at a given date which was February until March the 3rd, right? So either we were able to provide something meaningful by that date, we started the year before, nine months before, or we are irrelevant. And when we had to provide something meaningful, it means that we have to provide hopefully something that improves the existing knowledge, no matter how much, which improves. So we're not striving for optimality. We are not striving for exactness, for solving the problem, mathematically speaking, in a rigorous, elegant, and complete way, because you'll never be there, right? You have to produce something new, better than the existing one. This is experimental mathematics, but there is an issue here. The more math you know, the better will be your possibility of estimating the error or controlling the discrepancy. And this is pure math that helps you. The knowledge of PDEs and the way you use the knowledge of PDEs to produce error estimates, right? Priori or posteriori. So, and again, this is a very important role of mathematicians. You are not solving a problem exactly, but you are delivering a solution which is quote, 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 certified or controlled. So, uh, how much of, uh, of that is in, in this business? I honestly I don't know. See, in men like, like journalists ask, typically ask, uh, 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 which, uh, which is your contribution? Can you give us a percentage of your contribution? Uh, and I refuse to answer because, I mean, how can you quantify this? But I'm sure that uh, there is a contribution. It's very difficult to estimate it, but there is a contribution. And, uh, and, and this comes from the very role of mathematics. Even for those problems where you do not have a complete uh, mastership, you know that you can bring some external knowledge. And which is pretty much in our in our hands. 
Thank you. Okay. Uh, oh, Federico Picchi. Uh, thanks a lot for the very interesting talk. What is the role that researchers in mathematics should play in developing machine learning approaches with regards to computer scientists slash researchers in big companies? Okay, researchers in big companies have the advantage of having data. <laughs> so, uh, ChatGPT 3.5 is uh, trained on, uh, uh, I don't know how many data, but using uh, an estimate number of 175 billion parameters and other parameters. And uh, this is very time consuming and uh, com com computer consuming. So we don't know what is the consumption of electricity and production of, uh, say, pollution uh, that uh, is uh, associated with that. But we know for sure that uh, no one else will be able to train large language models today uh, like they do. And these, these are the major players in the world. So that, first of all, we have to admit this is a problem of governance of the old story. Uh, now, what is the role of mathematics? Well, I mean, I, I don't know, but uh, I mean, I, I cannot define it properly, but certainly see many different ways where uh, we, many different, say, uh, steps where mathematicians can step in and, uh, and, and, and then provide their contribution. The first, the first of all is interpretability. Uh, so we know that very often those uh, neural networks uh, work perfectly well and, uh, and in other cases they don't work at all and we don't know why. And uh, we are, we the mathematicians are used on working on, for instance, deterministic PDEs and we know that uh, under certain circumstances, under certain hypotheses, assumptions, we have well-posed operators and if the data stand in a suitable classes, the solution will exist, unique depend uh, and con continuity on data and will belong to a certain, say, functional class. This is pretty much lacking uh, today, lack lacking today in the, uh, in the ANN business, but it is true that there's been tremendous progress in mathematics, uh, mathematicians recently, in the past, I would say, few months uh, in, in this. And this is an open avenue, it's one way. Second is in uh, understanding the, as I was mentioned before, the. The, 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 the situation where this cost function, which are non convex function living in uh, 175 billion dimension at ChatGPT, right? I mean, how can you make sure that you end up with something which is a minimum? I'm not saying a global minimum, but at least a local minimum. I mean, this is, again, this is bread for mathematicians. Uh, and uh, the construction aspect. How do you build up a neural network that is suitable to produce a certain type of output, not solving a mathematical problem, produce a certain type of output, which is relevant for that specific community. Again, this constructive approach is pretty much in the hands of mathematicians. We have beautiful estimates today where you try to estimate the number of parameters or other parameters that are needed, and that they're still basically useless because, again, this constant, you cannot dominate all these constants. Right, all this asymptotic behavior. But that is the first way. I mean, I think that this is a role of mathematicians. Having said that, I have to say also that I'm very surprised to see the way computer scientists, in, in a totally independent way with respect to mathematicians, are progressing with different approaches, with a different attitude, but generalizing the existing knowledge of these the existing algorithms. And uh, this is a time where there is an incredible mismatch between computer scientists and mathematicians who are working on the same ground. That's the point. So they're working both on the same problem, but with totally different type of approach. And uh, in a, how we say, in Italian we say, uh, uh, well, without any communication, basically. And I, I think that this is a pity. I mean, we're really missing uh, a world of opportunities. 
because I'm convinced that the two forces can be put together just like engineers and mathematicians, engineers and computational physicists have been working together in the past to solve the basic equations of uh, the basic equations of nature. So it's a time where personally I would uh, love to see more convergent type of attitude between computer scientists and mathematicians for this specific kind of problems. Luckily enough, we have also some computer scientists in England, right? So, <laughs> okay, I think, uh, well, I think that maybe I will leave the floor to the president of the conclusion. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank Alfred for this beautiful colloquium, for also the wisdom that he gave us today. And I think that, well, in, in, uh, we are going through a change here in Indem. Uh, there have been elections, a new, a new um, government uh, bodies are going to be um, in charge very soon, by the end of the year, at the beginning of next year. But uh, we do have um, a role in all this, I think. Maybe not as a singular mathematician. Probably we, everybody should keep his own vocation. But as a community, for sure, Alfred pointed out a, a number of, well, of uh, goals, or at least of uh, um, fields of interesting and important and essential research, and also of, of responsibilities that we have with respect to the other science, but probably with respect to society. Um, we do have a role in validation of artificial intelligence. This is something crucial. Probably we have also, uh, um, we should learn and we should use it. But most, I think we have a responsibility, a responsibility to, to a collaboration with, with, the, with the outside world. And probably we should keep this in mind as an institute, because this is a, a place, uh, uh, an institution that really, well, gathers together ta mathematical talent and uh, we should be able to spend it in, uh, in a way that is recognizable by the rest of the scientific world and the rest of society. And so uh, it, it's for sure it's important for everybody to stick to his own work because uh, because everybody has a role and uh, should should do it uh, as you know, as possible best but as a community we do have a responsibility and i think that Alf, alfred pointed out very well this responsibility the responsibility also of just to start with to listen and then to try to talk to other uh, computer scientists, engineers, and uh, there are, uh, in, 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 in his talk, he was very, uh, well, really explained to us a lot. Uh, there are a number of situations where, um, it, uh, also for the theoretical mathematicians, there, there, there is space to just to use imagination, abilities, and talent, but still we do have the responsibility of delivering answers when somebody asks so uh, and the world is asking in some sense so we should take good care of these questions and uh, also learn to understand the questions and also as Alfio pointed out very very well um, helping others to ask the right questions this is crucial because uh, when you answer the, the, the right question, you have half of the, of the answer most of the time. So um, probably this is one of the last occasion I just talked to everybody as president of INDAP. So I'd like to uh, just to say thank to everybody. It was a pleasure to serve for uh, these long years. And it is a pleasure to uh, end this uh, session with such uh, that was really so, so interesting and so valuable for everybody. So thank you very much and uh, goodbye to everybody.